Well, hello, Crosscar fans. Uh, I got the budget build here. I've got the solid rear axle, and I was fabricating a solid rear axle articulating suspension. But I'm gonna be honest with you, my, my heart's not in it. I was halfway through the video, and it's just, it's not what I wanna do. So I'll give you some tips on if you want to do this. The main ideas is to get your heim exactly at the output of your sprocket. Now this is all one inch tubing. There's gonna be a one inch tube connected to an axle bearing out here with another one coming off here. So it'd be a Y connecting the shaft. Your strong points were gonna be by the wheel and by the sprocket because that's where the most stress is. What this configuration does is it makes the axle a stressed member of this whole setup. Now, to counteract the twisting of the axle, the chain alignment, I was just gonna run a sway bar. Sway bar is gonna let each independent wheel move a maximum of, I don't know, three inches per side. That's not gonna throw the, the chain alignment off at all. So, enough with that. <laughs> What I'm gonna do instead is get rid of all this, reconfigure the motor, and I'm gonna put an inexpensive independent rear suspension on it with the A-arms that are in the plans. So it's a good thing. Let's get to work. I'm, too, I'm super excited about this. All right, so C24, the lower cross member for the engine mount uprights, can be a little tricky. Uh, the cut wrapper says seven inches to the end. So your instinct is to measure seven inches and put the cut wrapper there. That's not the case. It's just like all the other ones. It's seven inches from the opposite end, right? So if you look, it's negative one half to the second wrapper. You measure from the opposite end, you make your mark at seven, and these cut wrappers are actually going to overlap. There we go. And you can visually double check the spacing on the chassis to make sure these are going to fit between the rear uprights. All right, so before we mount these bars, I'm going to mount the, the rear end. Now I've just got it tacked in there, and what I was looking for was vertical. I was looking for forward and backward spacing. I was looking for clearance for chain tensioning. The chain is gonna be a link short or a link long, so you're automatically gonna have a little bit one way or the other. And I'm checking to make sure it's aligned correctly so our chain doesn't wanna kick off, and then I'm just Tack it in place and we have this to, to work with. So now when I'm setting these bars, since everything on this chassis is adjustable, you can mount this way out here, you can mount it here. I'm gonna bring it inboard and I'm gonna look at chain clearance. I want the chain to go outside of this to the engine, so I'm not gonna put this right in the way, obviously. So I'm gonna slide it in and then I'm gonna match the other side then I'm gonna get this measurement for the cross member. All right, so the plans were written for an outlaw rear bearing carrier hub, whatever you wanna call it. And the top tab attachment tube on the A-arms is three and a quarter inches wide, and the bottom one is four and a half inches wide. Now that works for this, but we're using Razor 800 hubs. So I'm gonna measure this and just change the width of that tab. I'm gonna leave everything else the same, but I'm just gonna cut these tab attachment tubes to, to the width I need. And that way you can use any hub that you want. All right, so I already have a set of jigs made up, so I'm not gonna make a new set just to show you because it's super simple. You cut it, you follow the plans. Uh, the measurement from here to here is 10 and a half on both. This is the rear side. Uh, they sweep forward so that you get an offset axle to reduce plunge. But here are some of the pieces. Here's the three and a quarter piece. Now. I know you don't see a left and right side. That's because I made them uh, flippable. And then obviously I'll have to cut the tabs for that. Mm -hmm. 
Now I just have to take a hot minute and talk about Rogue Fab. These guys are awesome. I'm not sponsored, but I encourage you guys to get one of these benders if you want to do home fabrication. It makes it so easy. And I just bent two perfectly matched sets of A-arms. Look at how tight those tolerances are. Look at that. They're the exact same. Left and right is gonna be the exact same. Oh, I love these guys so much. And I'm getting ready to use their notcher, which is also super simple and super effective to use. Now, for the guys not using Rogue Fab benders, these are built onto a jig, so any imperfections in your bends are going to be totaled out in the jig. Uh, they'll still be straight and square, but they just won't be as easy to build. Get yourself a Rogue Fab bender and you will not regret it, I promise. All right, so we've got our, all of our pieces bent and notched. I'm gonna start by putting the three and a quarter notch in there. My notches came out perfectly as they always do. Thank you, Rogue Fab. And now you can see that these don't fit in here. We need to slice the ends of these off so it fits into the jig. This is long so you can get it in the bender, but it's also long if you're running an extra wide suspension All right, so now we'll do final fit up for weld. We've got our pieces cut off, fit it in here. Now what I do is I have a couple spare pieces of one inch. It's not worth making a jig that extravagant when you can just take a scrap piece and put it on there, under there to make sure everything's squaring up nice. Yeah, these came out great. And there we go, uh, left and right A-arms, upper and lower. So now we can start having fun. We're gonna put our Heim joints in. Now these are from 50 Caliber Racing. I used to get QSC off of Amazon and I found 50 Caliber Racing. They're very well priced, they're very nice, and their shipping is very, very quick. They're an awesome company. I bought some other stuff from them. That booster seat for my daughter is also from 50 Caliber Racing. I like those guys a lot. I check their website first when I do any kind of fabrication stuff for suspension, for anything, because I really like them. Not sponsored by them, just like them. So let's get these Himes tacked in and then we'll start setting our gap for what we need. All right, the test fit looks good. So now we have to make the brackets that connect it to the chassis. Now I just have some eighth inch by two inch flat bar and I do the backs as one bracket just like I did on the trailing arm suspension. It's just easier, it works out better, it's easier to mount, everything's squared and lined up and I like it. So, camber gain, let's talk camber gain. So if we put this, it looks like it's six inches. If we put these six inches apart, the upper A-arm is shorter than the lower. So we're gonna have built-in camber gain. Now, the shorter we make the chassis side versus the hub side, the more camber gain we're gonna get. I actually like camber gain. It makes them handle better in the corners. It gives you traction when you want it, when you're turning because there's an inherent body roll, it counteracts it. Just look up camber game. So I'm gonna put my holes, at least to start out. I bought a couple of these so I could play with it a little bit in case something goes wrong. I like to have backups. I'm gonna put my holes five inches apart. That's an inch less, which should yield a little more camber gain. So to get started, we need our clearance for the heim joint to the chassis. Now my go-to is 5 eighths in for good bolt position. 5 eighths in, if I make my hole there, 
this bolt will have plenty of meat all around it to hold it in place and it won't want to tear apart your bracket. It's just my go-to. It's worked on everything I've done. So we'll start with that. We'll go 5 8 in. And that's our punch for our first mark. This is going to leave room for the heim joint to clear the chassis when we mount it. Pretty simple, pretty easy. And I'll measure out five inches. Five eighths in. And then five eighths would be the cutoff point. So these are my two carrots for my punch. And then I will uh, make a cool little, little design. Now the first one you cut is gonna be your template for all of your other ones. So, make it look cool and then just copy it. I trim this to fit the inside radius, the inside radius of my tube so I can get the level right. Now, if you're an aesthetics guy like I am, you won't want a flap hanging off. So, I'm going to get this in position and I'm going to figure out where to bend this or cut it off. Now your alignment here, the idea is to get your drive shaft right in the middle of these. That'll be the least amount of plunge. But these Miata axles have a ton of plunge available, so I'm gonna run them a little lower. All right, so next we need to take a measurement of the rear bolts and their distance apart. Mine are seven and a half inches, so I marked the center line, and I went three and a quarter out and three and a quarter out. And then I went a half inch past that to hold our bracket. Now the way I put these in is I gusset the rear, and this is three inch, eighth inch plate, and I will make a bracket that just welds to here. It's worked out really well. I haven't had any problems with it. Um, but instead of having a square, crazy looking piece, I will mark a boundary for my bracket and then I'll cut it to a cool shape. Now, these are the brackets I make. They're just simple three wall brackets. Uh, I came up, I just drilled the center of it. So center punched it. It's a two inch gap, one inch hole, five eighths in and seven eighths back. That's just the clearance I came up with for what I'm using. Now, once you have that, it's as easy as putting the brackets on your hinds. Then you just center and space the bolts according to your rear end. Now it is an optical illusion. Uh, these look a lot farther apart than the ones in the back, but they're actually very, very square with them. So don't let that fool you and trust measurements, not your eyeball for this. All right, so I've got my cross member cut. Mine came out to be like two and three eighths, something like that and it's a nice tight fit. Now what I did to measure the height was I went straight across from this bolt, marked a line on the vertical, measured five inches up, and that's my top centering for my bolt. Now we just need to measure the distance. I measured the back, and I'm just gonna match that with tabs. I'm gonna use this cross member to mark center line so I can get a tab length off of that. All right, so here's what I'm looking at. I've got my cross member in, I've got center line marked, and five inches puts this pretty far away from my tube here. Now I could make a little bracket, I could make the arms really, really wide, 
but this is a problem. Every problem has a solution or multiple solutions. Uh, I was thinking I could get these, move them out, run the chain inboard center line. The chain would be a lot easier to get off. You wouldn't have to take off a hub, but the clearance in here would be too tight. My bracket would be super short, the tolerances. Secondly, I thought I could run the sprocket on the inboard side of the plate to get that extra clearance I needed, but then the motor would shift that way just as much, and it's already shifted uh, about as far as I want it over there. So option C, and the one I'm gonna go with, is I'm gonna cut a 10 inch piece of inch and a quarter, and I've already got my template for the notches. I'm gonna offset the notches and just run a solid bar across the back here. I think it'll look pretty slick. Uh, the brackets will look good, and it'll be super, super strong and it'll be a chance to square up the height and make sure it's completely level. All right, I'm gonna Tarantino this. I don't know if you guys like it when I explain it before I do it, show you the product after I did it and explain how I did it. I'm sure it's a mix of all of those, but uh, this is how I did it. So our separation on the top bolts was 10 inches, right? So I made my brackets first and I used spacing of five eighths from the end, and then I used three quarters. This is made out of three sixteenths rather than eighth because it's kind of out on a big moment. I measured the hole to the end of the bracket. That was one inch exactly. So that worked out well for me. So then I had eight inches remaining. So this piece is going to be eight inches. And then I took my template of the cross member I had in there that I cut, and it's exactly two and a quarter inches. So that kind of turned out easily as well. So I marked four inches as the center line, and then I marked an inch and a quarter to each side, drew a boundary, and then five eighths of that because it's an inch and a quarter hole saw, and then another five eighths onto that to show my end boundary. That gives me my holes. I offset it down five eighths of an inch, which is half of an inch and a quarter. And when you put it all together, it is 10 inches hole to hole. Let's put it on the buggy. All right, so I've already got my five inches of separation marked I'm just gonna slide this in place, and since it's hole saw cut, I can adjust the height. And I'm gonna put the center of that down the center of my tube. I'll tack it in place. I'll weld these on the end, and we have an upper A-arm mount. Now, I, I hope I didn't lose you guys with this. You can do this. You can do all of this. Uh, if you always look for solutions, you'll find solutions. If you always think, oh man, it's wrong. I can't do this. Then that's gonna be your results. So you can do this. Don't be scared of this stuff. It's not that bad. And if you mess up this piece, it's only eight inches of tube. Grab it, try it again. You're gonna do it better the second time. All right, so now I'm gonna do a pre-alignment check. I've got the axles out of the way. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run these up together to make sure they're both pointing in the same direction. Uh, once we get the wheel on, we'll do a wheel alignment, but these are all square. Uh, I set these at the exact same distance. So like this one had two turns out to, to get it aligned. The one over there had one turn out and it was aligned. The A-arms themselves are square. The brackets we made are square. We squared our mounts to the back. So everything is square by nature. Now we're gonna make tabs. Now with your initial alignment check done, you're gonna to wanna to reinstall your axle. Now the axle plunge, you can see it going in and out, right? We wanna put it towards the outer boundary because as this flexes, it's gonna to wanna to push the axle in. But with the wheel running forward, we don't have to worry about that too much. So now we just make tabs. Now you wanna get your wheel set up so that it's at zero camber, or at least that's how I do it, zero camber, just to start because we have all of this adjustment on the A-arms. 
So it looks like our tabs are gonna be pretty short, which is a good sign. That means the measurements for this works with the Miata axles and the rear end. So now I'll just take a measurement from the center of the hole to the end of, end of the A-arm. It looks like it's exactly one inch. And that's gonna be my tabs. Check the bottom ones, and it looks like it's an inch and three eighths. Do it at an inch and a quarter. So one inch and an inch and a quarter. All right, so I've got the tabs on and tight, and I've got four stacks of wood. I've got uh, three three sixteenths inch pieces. Now you just want clearance from the boot. What this, the angle of this doesn't matter, but the higher this is up, the more ground clearance you'll have. So I ran it to a good spot where I thought it should be, and now I'm just gonna tack in the bottom, and the top is still adjustable. And I'm gonna use that tack on the bottom so that I can just hold the top and weld it in. Now it's sitting on its own with no support and you can do a check for binding. Look at how much travel that is, that's crazy. That's awesome. All right, so first off, the stock nine inch wheels aren't gonna work. They are a super high offset. They're like one inch to six inches. I think they're seven inches wide. And this is a Polaris 800 hub. I think those take 12 inch wheels. I had small hopes that these were gonna work, but I knew that they weren't. I use them because I can see everything that's going on if I flip them because there's no, nothing in the way. But, 10 inch wheels fit perfectly. We've got a couple sets of these laying around, but I wanted to show you this. Look at all of this travel with no binding at all. That's fantastic. Look at the camber gain. Look at how the hub just moves right with it. It's so fantastic. We have camber adjustment. We've got toe adjustment. We've got plunge adjustment. I love doing A arms. I know trailing arms probably are easier but i don't always take the easy route i take the longevity route these are going to last forever the himes are replaceable the a-arms themselves are replaceable because we built them from jigs i just I, I love this setup so much so yeah i could jack it up and show you there's probably a few more inches to travel on the bottom depending on what size tire you're running that's where we're starting to bind we're running out of angle on the axle but jeez that's crazy, that's probably 18 inches at least. There's probably another, uh, maybe another two inches on the bottom. So 20 inches of travel in a go-kart, crazy. I'm not gonna use all that, but it's nice to know I have it if I want it, if I ever wanna make a, a super beach buggy. All right, now that the rear end's buttoned up, let's turn our attention to engine mounting. I use these same two stacked inch and a half square tubing from the jig um, to space it accordingly to give clearance for the driven pulley, whatever you want to call it, the CVT, and to clear the chain off the upper A-arm mount. Now, the positioning is good. I'm probably going to take the tank off and relocate it just because it's hard to get to the fill tank. Uh, I'm not going to walk you through every step of this because it's extremely simple. Stack two of these, mount the plate, 
um, mind your bolts. You want access to the bolts. So that's it. Let's get the engine mounted. All right, so due to the nature of the mounting plate and the adjustable rear end, we have two positions that we can use. Now, I wanna be able to access this gas cap. So to avoid relocating the gas tank, I'm gonna run this as far forward as I can to get the gas cap off so I can put gas in it without it being under the harness bar. But I'm also gonna pay attention to the, the chain tension. I can't have the sprocket running all the way forward or else it's gonna rub on something. So I'm gonna move the motor back as far as I can and I'm gonna run the sprocket as forward as I can because chains only stretch, they don't shrink. If we were to run a smaller sprocket, we would have to relocate the gas tank, but that's not a big deal. It's only four bolts, it should be easy. But for right now, with this setup, Let's just set it up to run it. Now, I'm gonna take a hot minute to just function check everything. Everything's welded, everything's aligned. The rear end is tight. So I'm gonna start it up and just see if everything works correctly. Gotta love a motor with no exhaust. So that works phenomenally. So it, the axles are on jack stands and it's still stopped, which means it's not gonna lurch when it's... All right, let's talk suspension. Suspension isn't super cosmic. ATV shocks are roughly 120 pounds per inch spring rate. In layman's terms, that means for every one inch this spring is compressed, you get 120 pounds of force. So if you start with a lower spring rate, you can jack the preload up to get it where you need to be. So I use ATV shocks from a Polaris Outlaw or Polaris Predator. They're super cheap, they have a ton of adjustability and there's aftermarket springs available. We'll get these mounted up and we will adjust the preload. Now, as far as mounting, angle, suspension, rebound, preload, all that stuff, there's two ways to do it. You can look up the math and you can figure out the angle you want, where to position it, or you can do trial and error. So this is heavier than an ATV. ATV shocks are usually about halfway out the arm. So slightly heavier if you run it outboard more the spring is gonna have authority over the arm. If you run it inboard, the arm is gonna have authority over the spring. So if we ran these all the way in like this, we'd have 20 inches of travel, but this 120 pound per inch spring rate would turn into like nothing. So I run my shocks pretty far outboard because I'm not super worried about having 18 inches of travel. I think eight to 10 inches of travel is plenty for a mini buggy or cross cart or the stuff I'm building. It's worked out really well to not have a ton of travel because I use good shocks. On the next episode, we'll be mounting a sway bar to get the rear end under control. We are going to come up with a custom exhaust for that Predator engine, and we're gonna do some test driving to see how well this thing performs, what kind of top speed we can get, and see how much everybody likes driving it. Please like 
subscribe. There's so much more to come. Thank you for watching. Two, three more laps.